Oké. Okay. Ja. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is goed. Oké. Okay. En er komen dan dus misschien nog wel mensen binnen, maar als je wil gewoon een tijdje laat. Ja, is goed. Uh, voor, volgens mij was het uh, voor die, die oudere meneer daar achter. Daar. Wie? Uh, nee, volgens mij niet. Ja. Ja. Ah, oh, dat zou heel goed kunnen. Hè? Oh, grappig. <laughs> Dankjewel. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session titled, Is the West Taking Enough Responsibility? Where we'll be looking at a youth perspective on climate justice. My name is Harriet Tubari. I am a public speaker, social entrepreneur, and diversity officer. And I must say that I'm absolutely honored to be here this morning to talk to you about such a topic, ab about such an important topic. Um, when I was asked to moderate this session, I actually immediately said yes, because for one, I believe in the importance of having such a day, such a day as this one to celebrate Africa and everything that has to do with it. And secondly, because climate injustice is real. And it truly saddens me to know that those who are least responsible for global warming are the ones that are mostly affected by its consequences. And the fact that as society, we do not give them enough attention. So I'm actually quite happy to see so many of you here to 
take part in this conversation. And I also applaud the FMS Youth Think Tank who have been working on climate justice with a focus on African perspectives for organizing this session and allowing us to have a conversation with great panelists. Yulia, one of the members of the Youth Think Tank will shortly tell us more about their work. The structure of this session is actually quite simple. We will start with Yulia, who will introduce the work of the Youth Think Tank. Then we will have a panel. Uh, and last but not least, there will be some concluding remarks by myself based on what we have discussed today. And also Joe, one of the uh, participants of the Youth Think Tank. Um, before we start, I would like to introduce you to Yves uh, Kolumdua. Yves is a cartoonist from Congo, and through his art, he criti criticizes society and politics, for example, regarding climate justice. Um, this work is not without any consequences, and as a result of that, Yves actually uh, is a participant of the initiative by, Just, uh, by peace, uh, Justice and Peace the Netherlands, which is called Safe Haven, Artist Safe Haven. Um, unfortunately, Yves could not be here this morning, but his art is here. You can see it there and here on this side, and it is inspired by this session of the Youth Think Tank. You can buy this art if you want, and if you want more information, you can also uh, go and see Kirsten, who is over there. Uh, she will provide you with some more information about Yves' work. Even though he is not here today, I would like us all to give him a warm welcome, a warm applause for his work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so this session centers around a proposal by the Think Tank, and we therefore would like to ask you to share your feedback and ideas with us via the Mentimeter here. Um, and to answer the question, what is the best way for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs to take responsibility regarding climate justice in Africa? I will give you some time to fill in the Mentimeter, and then we will continue. Okay, I feel like it's good to tell you that the input received from this session and also from the ranking will be used uh, by the think tank to further formulate the proposal for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So thank you very much for filling that in. Um, it's also important to know that this session will be 
recorded uh, and that there will also the pictures will also be taken so if you do not want to be in any of the pictures please at the end of this session come see the organization they are seated on the front row and they will make sure that you are not in any of the pictures um, with that being said I would like to ask Yulia De Witt to come to the stage. Yulia is a student in international relations and one of the participants of the FMS Youth Think Tank. And she will explain to us the vision of the Youth Think Tank, the preliminary, pre preliminary findings, uh, and everything around the Think Tank. Please give her a round of applause. So can everybody hear me correctly? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. All right, so since May last year, the Dutch government has adopted an integrated Africa strategy. And of course, this is a great development, but a strategy is just a starting point. And for that reason, we were asked to give our young perspectives to help this starting point create action. Um, for that reason, we were given the dilemma on how the West can take responsibility for climate injustice in Africa. For the past months, we've been working very hard on formulating a practical advice regarding climate injustice in Africa, for an advice for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the Dutch Africa strategy speaks about climate injustice mainly in global agreements, such as the Paris Agreements and the uh, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. But it also speaks about the importance of investing in a just and inclusive transition to renewable energy, the creation of green jobs, local agency, and inclusion of women and youth. And these two latter points are exactly at the core of our advice. Uh, over the past few months, we as the youth think tank have uh, spoken to academics, activists, youth organizations, we have had very valuable uh, dialogues with African youth climate activists and entrepreneurs. And uh, in these conversations and these lectures, it became clear to us that local agency is at the core um, when you want to reach climate uh, justice. Uh, so today, we are here to enhance our advice. We would like to use your feedback and your suggestions and especially the panel suggestions and feedback. To enhance our advice, we will going to present to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in just a few weeks. So let's dive into our conclusion. Uh, uh, it became clear to us that local agency is one of the central pillars when speaking about building up climate resilience and taking responsibility for the climate injustice in Africa. Um, the key message that became clear to us is words are not enough we need to see action but also don't talk about us without us for that reason we propose the following advice from june 2024 onwards we would propose yearly online consultations with african representatives including youth and women to evaluate the goals that are formulated in the africa st strategy regarding climate resilience and climate justice um, so what would these consultations look like? Uh, the consultation panel would include African representatives from different African countries. Uh, they would have the opportunity to voice any concerns or praises they have, problems they encountered throughout the year, or projects they think the Netherlands should contribute to. Because we cannot evaluate African involvement without involving our African partners. These consultations need to be in an open and safe environment where criticism is welcomed. The Netherlands should really express that they would like to enhance their projects and therefore criticism is welcome. And also safety is guaranteed. Um, we would also involve uh, local NGOs to uh, uh, set up a representative group of people who are not uh, dependent on the Dutch government to avoid bias. We would also need a yearly report with a list of clear objectives from the Dutch government to really critically evaluate if the objectives are being met. If the objectives are not sufficiently met, 
um, the panel can get the consultation panel can give advice on how to enhance this or incorporate the local community better. Um, so today, as I said, we would like to enhance our advice that we will present to the Dutch MFA in a few weeks. We would like your input and the panel's input. Please be as critical or as praising as you would like to be. Everything is welcome. We hope you enjoy your, our session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, for sharing uh, your work. I think it's really important, and as Julia said, please share everything that you want to share with them because it can help them improve their proposal. We have a suggestion box there uh, where you can put your ideas. I think you all have some pen, pen and paper as well, so make use of it. Uh, there is no such thing as bad ideas. Everything is welcome. They will make use of it. Um, with that being said, I would now actually like us to move to the main event of this session, which is the panel discussion. Uh, and for that, I would like to invite to the stage climate activist Hilda Nakabuye. Please give her applause. Applause. MEP Mohamed Shahim. And Professor Ruth Carlitz. It's somewhere there. I think it's in your bag. <laughs> it was a crazy day. <laughs> Well, we are so happy to have you here, all three of you. Um, I read a little bit about you guys, but I am not sure to what extent the public knows you. So I would like to ask you all to introduce yourselves in two to three sentences. And I will start with you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, yes, my name is Ruth Carlos. I'm an assistant professor in political science at the University Hello. Yes. Great. Uh, Ruth Carlitz, I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of Amsterdam. As you can maybe hear from my accent, I'm not originally from the Netherlands. I'm from the US. I've been here just a bit over a year. Um, but my research looks at um, foreign aid effectiveness and ineffectiveness and in the focus of African politics, um, inspired in part by over three years that I've spent living and working in Tanzania working with in the NGO sector there. And so I've continued alongside my academic work to also work as a consultant to both local NGOs and also international organizations like UN Women and the World Bank. And I'm really excited to be here because climate finance is a new area of research for me. So I, I made clear to the think tank that I'm, I'm not yet an expert in climate finance. So I'm also really here to learn. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Hilda. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hilda, and I come from a farmer's community in the basin of Lake Victoria in Uganda, where I started a youth movement called Fridays for Future Uganda. And as for as long as I remember, I've been a climate activist, and I'm glad to be here to share youth perspectives from frontline communities. Thank you. Mohamed? Well, I'm Mohamed Shahim. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Social Democratic Group. I'm also a vice president for that group, responsible for, I could say, everything related to climate, energy, agriculture. And I was the, um, let's say, the rapporteur, the main negotiator for the carbon board adjustment mechanism. I can explain why it's a good idea, but I know that I had some hustles with some NGOs about it, and I think fairly, but let's see how we can use those tools to help other countries to adapt, but also to mitigate. Uh, that's my introduction. Super, thank you so much. Great to have so many uh, different people with different backgrounds, but also so much knowledge on climate. Um, I would like to start with you, Hilda. Um, you know, you said that for as long as you remember, you have been a climate activist. 
but there must have been something that triggered you. So I actually was wondering, what does climate justice mean to you and how do you see it in your community? I've been an activist because coming from a community like mine, you are born into the effects of climate change. Uh, the day you're born, it rains so hard or, you know, and your parents have to find a way to make sure you survive. So all my life, I've been fighting for survival with the effects of climate change. And uh, what that really means is what I remember vividly is growing up uh, in this community I remember a time when I was about 10 years, uh, we had a very big plantation in my community. And uh, this, this night when it rained so hard, uh, it was so strong. And I remember we almost didn't sleep at night uh, because the rain kept entering the house. But when it was morning, it was still drizzling. Uh, we couldn't walk to the farm, but you could see from afar all the plants were bent in one direction. So the winds that blew at night just blew the garden to one direction and all the crops were bent. And I had never seen anything like this in my life. And I asked my grandmother what had happened. And she told me that gods had cast us. To me, this didn't sunk because I knew that the gods had an IQ. And if they <laughs> were seeing <laughs> we didn't do anything wrong, why would they cast us? So it stayed with me. And then um, as I grew up, I, I kept thinking, why would the gods curse us? So when I joined university, I learned about climate change. This wasn't a topic that is taught in schools in Uganda. Even until now, we are still pushing our government, but it's really hard. So learning about climate change was through a local non-government organization that came to our school. And it taught us about the effects, the challenges, and the role that you have to play in combating climate change and this opened my eyes and that's when I became very vocal about climate change and trying to raise awareness so that other people can also understand it and in any case if uh, they can work and they don't have to pass through the same experience I passed through growing up. So I started volunteering with this local NGO and uh, we started creating awareness in schools and moving to communities, talking to different people about climate change. So that was 2017 and then in 2019, I joined the Fridays for Future movement after Greta Thunberg's strike outside the Swedish parliament and I had my first strike outside my university alone uh, even my friends couldn't join me because it was a crazy idea. I stood there for like 25 minutes. I also didn't know what I was doing, but I'm pretty sure I wanted to communicate <laughs> climate change because I had this placard that had uh, our environment is at risk, uh, climate action now. And uh, people started coming to ask me what I was doing, why I was holding this placard, who is paying me to stand in the sun and all these crazy <laughs> questions. And I, I was responding, uh, I told them about climate change, I told them about the effects that they're experiencing in their communities are, is what we call climate change. But it was very hard for people to understand. But when I noticed that people really wanted to know what I was doing, I went back the next Friday and the next Friday after that and a few people came joining me and I kept uh, also going to other schools and calling people to join me. And what was a one-person strike, uh, we now have a movement of 54,000 students and people wow. in Uganda. That's worth an applause, guys. <laughs> so for me, climate justice means reaching out to the people who are most affected and uh, creating awareness with these people building uh, solutions together with these people and having them represented, having their voices represented in spaces where climate change is talked about and having them, uh, giving them a seat at the table where solutions are being discussed because they are the people on the front lines. They're bearing this brunt every day, every time, so they can draw on their experiences to offer solutions. And climate justice means having these voices um, represented, not just present, but uh, represented. There's a saying that giving them a seat at the table or if we are not on, 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 the seat, on the table, we have to be in the menu. But 
to me this doesn't work because I can't just be at the table and keep quiet. My ideas have to be uh, shared, for example. And if you have brought me to the table, then you have to listen. So these voices need to be listened to, they need to be heard. Uh, it's not just about putting these voices in, in the papers, but they have to be listened to. And um, it's also, for me, climate justice is uh, having uh, people on the front lines uh, present. And with this, it means women and youth front and center of all decisions that are being made for them. Because as youth, we have a longer future to, to live. So whatever is being uh, decided, the policies, we are the implementers. So we have to know about it. And um, to me, climate justice is climate action. If we can act as fast as we can, that is what climate justice sh should be. Nice, thank you so much. I saw you both nodding in agreement, and obviously the West is doing something, perhaps not enough, uh, but can we talk about what type of responsibility they are taking on climate justice? And I will start with you. I have to say I'm not a woman, but in politics I'm still considered young, especially in the European Parliament, and the average age is 60 something. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons that climate action is still not taking at a level, I think, where it's needed. Although I have to say in the European Parliament, in the last four years, we have been really uh, taking steps that at least um, give the right direction. I think when it comes to climate justice, for me, there are three elements that are very important to understand. And of course, I, I, I mean, I cannot represent someone who really sees the effects of climate change on a day-to-day -day basis, although also here extreme weather events are becoming more normal. So it's not something that's for a faraway land. Also here we say, see that climate adaptation is basically not a plan B anymore. We need it. For me, there are three elements that are very important. One, acknowledging who caused this disaster. It's really strange, but when you have a fight, people don't usually seek an uh, apology, but at least uh, agreeing that you were the cause of this issue helps. Uh, we've seen it in the last year's climate conference that this acknowledgement by the West was a very big step forward when it comes to, let's say, the framework for loss and damage. We didn't finish it, but I have good hopes that we will finish it uh, very soon. Second, there's this comment about differentiated responsibility, which means that based on historic emissions, some countries have a bigger responsibility to act one of the elements is basically climate finance. And the third one, and this is for me very important, and this is where social democracy, international solidarity uh, gets a green face. Because at the end of the day, I really believe that through action, through action when it comes to climate change, we can decrease inequality. The other way around, if we don't take action, inequality will be increasing not only between countries, but also within countries, because most affected people are the people with low income groups, uh, children, women, um, and, and for me, this is very important. So taking that all to into consideration, I, I have to say, you know, the 1.5 degrees, if you are honest, you know, we need to keep hope that it's mm. within reach. Mm. But all scientists know that probably in four or five years we'll be there. The question will be how fast can we be can we get below 1.5 degrees and how much damage can we hopefully then prevent because that's where we stand now and next cop where we for the first time look at the global stock take to so where do we stand hopefully this is a waking up for many countries in the world that they should raise their ambition so is the west or uh, let's say the global north doing enough no is Europe showing leadership when it comes to climate change, when it comes to the climate law? I have to say yes, because we have not only made pledges, we've written them into legislation. So they come with a consequence if companies, governments do not uphold to these laws. Is it enough? Not yet, but let's see if, uh, if we can get that in a couple of months. Well, it's less than a month. <laughs> so the West, the global North is not doing enough. Uh, Europe has started doing something, and if I understood correctly, accountability, uh, finance, 
and solidarity is something that is key. Uh, obviously, you uh, focus or your research is going to focus on finance. Do you have something to add to this? Sure. So I think in line with the recognition of responsibility for the, the situation that we're in, there has been um, pledges and commitments made. This uh, the, the, the commitment um, that is most prominent is this commitment to mobilize 100 billion US dollars annually in climate finance. So climate finance, this is a broad term and it refers to local, national, and transnational financing. It can be public, private, or alternative sources of financing to address both mitigation, so making the problem less bad in the future, investing in things like renewable energy, efforts to stop deforestation, and also adaptation. And adaptation is really at the forefront of the loss and damage, the suffering basically visited upon the countries and communities that have not contributed so much to the problem of climate change but are now suffering it from it. And so following this commitment, in the last decade has seen actually dramatic increases in climate finance being committed and dispersed by countries in the global north. We've still yet to reach this $100 billion target, but there is progress there. Um, but there's, there's also questions about what these commitments really mean. And so, um, Underneath the, the data, you know, it's always good to question the statistics. Um, Oxfam does this climate finance shadow report that I, that I recommend you check out if you're interested in learning more. But basically, Oxfam argues that due to the different reporting practices of different countries, only a quarter of this, you know, money that's been committed should really be considered real support. And this has to do with uh, reporting loans at, as, as the equivalent of grants, sort of different different ways that, that countries report this. So I think there's, there's certainly some cynicism, and, and perhaps rightly so, about these commitments. But at the same time, there, there is something being done. And so what I'm actually really interested in my research, and I think we'll, we'll pick this up as the conversation goes on, is you know, w without just sort of complaining about it's not enough, it's, it's not meeting the target, which I think there's important advocacy to be done there, um, but actually looking at what is being committed, what is being dispersed, is it in line with actually what countries in the Global South say they need? So there are these instruments as part of the Paris Agreement. Every country, and not just in the Global South, but every country prepares what's called a nationally determined contribution. Basically, it's a roadmap for how they're going to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. And importantly, countries in the Global South, in their roadmap, they also say, yeah, we can't fully fund this on our own. So here's what we need to reach these targets. And so what I'm trying to look into in my research is from those sort of expressions of here's what we need, is the money that's being provided actually lining up with that? I think that's actually a nice bridge to the next part of this session where we are going to dive a little bit deeper into the feedback you have for the proposal. And the question that I have is actually, who should be consulted when monitoring and evaluating the Africa strategy? And which voices can specifically not be excluded? Um, let's start with you, uh, Hilda. Who cannot be excluded? I think this is an obvious question because if you are uh, looking at communities uh, or where money is being spent, you have to look at the communities where it's going. And in this case, it's communities that are affected, uh, that are impacted by climate change. But we have a problem uh, in Africa where the climate finance comes through our government and uh, governments don't uh, implement or don't put the money where it has to be. So you find that communities that are supposed to get uh, this money or that are supposed to be supported are not getting the needed support that they are getting and money ends up going elsewhere. So where is the money being put in the first place? Is it being given to governments? Is it being given to grassroots communities? And who is it supporting? Where do the governments or the people who get it put it? So I think these are the two things that have to be looked up in 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 my understanding. Yeah, and uh, Ruth, what do you think that the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, need to include when consulting uh, these representatives? So I think it's it's really important to to really dig into who these representatives 
represent and, and do they really represent them? And I think this is, you know, when we talk about, okay, African countries should have a seat at the table, who's actually sitting at that table? Is it a youth activist like Hilda? Or is it a senior official in the ministry who's always flying around the world, going to elite conferences, staying in nice hotels? You know, I think there's often a sort of like, you know, at these big international summits, it's a lot of global elites meeting together and feeling good about themselves. And so I think actually really ensuring that the representatives really represent the communities they purport to represent is important. Mm -hmm. And then I think another community, and maybe this sounds a bit uh, self-serving, but I think also consulting academics who do research on these topics, and especially when their findings are, you know, a bit at odds with, with the political strategy. And I mean, I think this is a bit off topic, but I noticed that very prominently in the Africa strategy is this part of the effort to reduce irregular migration. And I, I think there's there's a lot of academic research that suggests that that maybe this strategy is a bit misguided. I can, that's a bit off topic, but but I think that including critical voices and listening to them, it's it's hard. But I think something I really admire about the proposal of the youth think tank is that having these consultations and making sure there is space where criticism can be heard. And then I think balancing the safety of participants is really important, but also some transparency and public scrutiny over the criticism that's being provided. So it doesn't just get sort of, okay, we are going to listen to the things that sound nice to us and we're going to just sort of tune out the criticism. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, Mohammed, um, you have experience in involving African countries in climate negotiations. Uh, can you give some example, some advice on how to involve the uh, underexposed under <laughs> people in consultations. So for instance, women, but also the youth like Hilda. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very complicated topic. I, I do believe that uh, uh, when we organize, I mean, let me, I'm gonna say a couple of unorthodox stuff. You know, I don't care about strategies. You know, strategies look nice, but if they don't have an implementation, if they don't come with a plan, with a financing strategy, I've seen too many of these, let's say, strategies. They look nice, you present them, you shake hands, you make a pledge, and you never do anything. This, <laughs> is, this, is, this is, you know, and at the end of the day, what I see, and I have to be honest, also, if, you, if I look at some African, let's say, country governments, the mentality has significantly is changing. You know, they don't want the colonialism 2.0 when it comes to, let's say, all the critical raw materials that Africa has. It has actually no economic reasoning why Africa shouldn't be a very highly developed region. As I mean, so many resources. And what I've seen now that, for example, Mozambique, when they found lithium, told the West, you know what? You can buy batteries from us. We will not sell you lithium. And I think that's very interesting. Because that's the mentality I think we need. We need to work on partnerships with clear investment plans that benefit both based on equality. But and, and then at the end of the day, who, uh, uh, I mean, th that's how we should at least approach it. And when we talk to governments, we should of course also talk to the NGOs and to youth represented, uh, youth organizations, to women organizations, to see how they are included. For example, let's if we if we would organize a set up, let's say uh, a battery plant, I would like it to see that these batteries are also beneficial for the communities locally. They should not only be exported. Uh, when we set up a solar plant or a wind farm, cheap electricity should also be accessible for the people living there. Because why else would we only invest and then export it? That that's not based on equality. So. What you see in the European Parliament, we, we just finalized last week, the Critical Raw Materials Act, which is a quite interesting act. And one of the elements there is that we said, if you look at the supply chain, let's say from critical raw materials to finalized products, at least two steps should be in the country of origin. So not only extraction, but also refinery or b b creating a, an additional economic value. Because what we want is also to share the added value of these type of products because that's the sustainable, I think that's sustainability at its core because you help 
you solve climate change uh, because we need these type of uh, products to be produced, but also you make sure that the local community benefits from this, this enterprise. This is something that I really like. Uh, but as I said, at the end of the day, we need real specific plans. And when developing the pl these plans, I think together with African countries and European countries, we have to make sure that everyone is involved that needs to have a, a voice in these plans, because that's how you get support from, from underneath. I totally agree with what you're saying, uh, but like experience show us or have demonstrated that when you are negotiating with, for instance, African countries, um, there is a power balance imbalance. Uh, the European Union does have certain power more say in to what extent is this taken into consideration when talking to these people about these initiatives that really do uh, affect them? So what I say is that progressive politicians in the EU also see that our relation has to change. We cannot, you know, just because of the um, benefits of all these critical raw materials to produce all kinds of sustainable products. And of course, the resources, you, I mean, Africa is a very rich resource uh, um, a continent. Because we know this and because we want to set up all kinds of, let's say, partnerships, we want to do that in a balanced way. We want to do that in such a way that they also benefit of these projects based on equality. So politicians like me, and I'm not the only one, there's a progressive majority there, set up criteria. So as I said that, it's not only about extraction and then leaving everything there, it's also the responsibility. We have due diligence legislation coming up where we are responsible for, let's say, social and environmental standards, even if they're not in Europe. Uh, you have a responsibility, but also to make sure that a bigger share of the value of, let's say, the supply chain or the value chain is developed in those countries. So they, uh, that more people benefit and not only the ones that, you know, own the land. I mean, that this is a principal shift in thinking. And I hope we are not there yet. We didn't show it yet. Let me also be honest. Eh? This is something we have to develop in, in the next years. But there I really see that when it comes to loans, if it's if it's invested in mitigation, that's not a big deal because there's a return on investment, there's an economic value to be created. When it comes to adaptation, a loan is crazy. There we need to distinguish between the goal of let's say the financial instrument and how it's filled. But but I'm 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 quite positive that next COP next COP is about three elements. The NDCs needs to be updated because of the global stock take. Second, international climate finance and the, fi and the fund or framework around loss and damage. And third, which is something that I'm really excited about, access to sustainable technology, sustainable energy for all countries. Because that access is not, is not there yet. Solar panels are sold in the West. They are not that accessible for many, let's say, poorer countries. And this is something quite interesting because there's also an inequality compared to quite expensive coal electricity with all the pollution where you can install windmills or solar panels and have access to cheap and sustainable energy. And I think that third element is also important in decreasing emissions in, in, in many countries, but also have access to cheap and affordable, affordable energy. Thank you. Uh, there is now some time for questions from the public. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hands and then one of our colleagues is going to go to you. So please say your name yes. and ask your question. Hello, yes. Um, <clears throat> I feel like uh, uh, almost like an obligation to speak. My name is Stefano Bellucci. I teach African political economy and African history at Leiden University. And I was invited by some students who give me this nice blue <laughs> access to drinks, whatever. So I feel like now I have to kind of contribute somehow. <laughs> but you know, uh, um, uh, it's, um, it's um, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I really enjoyed this. And, um, but um, I would like to, you know, kind of depart from some kind of critical points because I hear here, you know, climate and justice, these two words together. So let's analyze justice. Eh? Justice has two aspects. One is legal eh, and one is social. The legal acts, so we, you want to make a contribution through the Dutch government by, you know, about climate, eh, as, I, as much as I understand. So now the first question is, uh, uh, how much trust you can build vis-a-vis eh, uh, 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 -vis the government uh, in international justice, because that kind of justice, in, you're not talking about criminal justice, eh, but international justice, when you, you know 
that, for example, eh, I'm just using an example, there are, you know, in the Middle East, you know, huge breaches of international laws, and a government doesn't do anything. This government, like the Italian government, I'm Italian. So, I mean, uh, so why on climate uh, uh, they can do something, whereas they cannot do when, you know, criminal, international, you know, criminal law is uh, uh, not respected, for example, in Gaza, or whatever. So, number one. Number two, the social aspect of it, and that actually concerns Africa, because, you know, there is a big debate when I was teaching, you know, uh, one of the lectures is about this, and uh, within Africa itself. What is uh, uh, justice from a social perspective? Uh, is it a right to pollute? or a right uh, 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 to be compensated if you don't pollute. And African countries, governments, policymakers, economists are divided into two groups. And in every debate, you have uh, South Africa, for example, always promotes the fact that we have the right to pollute, which is not nice for us here who do not like uh, 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 war global warming. Why is that so? Because you Europeans polluted for 300 years because you industrialized. Because you industrialized, you colonized, because you were richer and more powerful. Now it is our turn, okay? It is a point of view, I mean, of course, you know, and we have to take this seriously. On the other hand, the other point of view says, look, we have green energy now in the, you know, the 2.0, 3.0, 5.0 now, you know, we can industrialize without polluting. But that industrialization with less pollution, you know, less carbon, you know, uh, uh, driven, ha requires a lot of capital. It's yes, can you conclude, yes. please? Yes, software, uh, software is capital. Eh? So now, and I come to the other two words that I see together here, climate and finance. Finance means to conclude something. In a capitalist world, we you know, conclude everything that is transactionary, and every transaction is by money. I even heard the word loan. Eh? So that implies always and always you know, an interest rate Okay, so can that mechanism, financial mechanism, be s suitable for doing something about climate change when we know that the whole problem starts with capitalism itself? So the core capitalist element, which is finance, interest rate, money, will that be able to solve the problem? That is a big question. We'll start with the last question, and I think you are very suitable to answer That's that, uh, Ruth. That's academics for you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, these are these are really challenging questions, and I think I think there there's a healthy and important degree of cynicism and skepticism around the whole climate finance mechanism. So expecting it to solve the problem, no, I think that's completely unrealistic. I also just in in my sort of approach to the world and and my research and the advice I've given to policymaking organizations, I'm I'm a pragmatist. So I think this, this framework does exist. And so saying we ignore it because capitalism is, is the problem and so a capitalist system is never going to solve it, I mean, I, I, I respect that and I think there's also a really important role for imagination and idealism and thinking of the world that we want to see in the future and imagining a completely different world than the one that we live in. But I also think that there's work to be done within the world that we live in to sort of move it to a, a slightly more just place. And so there, I, I, think, there's, I think there's room to do both. And, and maybe it's not the same people, not the same organizations who are, who are doing both, because then you sort of lose your mind. But um, I think that there is room to push at the margins to make the framework that we have really live up to its goals. And, and maybe just one, one other point that, that Stefano's co comment, first comment um, inspired me and, and I was already thinking about, I think he, he pointed out very rightly that, okay, yes, there's an Africa strategy, but Africa is composed of 54 countries and within each of those 54 countries, there are very diverse interests. And so I think it's a challenge, even if you're saying we're going to consult local actors, local communities, like, people from within the same country or across different countries may have very different views. And so I think it's also like, I would really, really, really caution against any sort of one size fits all approach to dealing with Africa, rather thinking about really taking seriously the specific concerns of different countries, recognizing that there are going to be trade-offs, deciding how to address those trade-offs in 
a just way. You know, people are going to be disappointed whatever you whatever you do, but but not deluding yourself that you can sort of satisfy everyone by consulting the community because there is no one voice of the community in Africa. In the same way there's no one voice of the community in Europe or even in the Netherlands. Yeah, thank you. Hilda, would you like to add something to that? Perhaps also more focusing on the first part of this question, whether uh, we can expect Europe or the Global North to invest in the Africa strategy when they are not able uh, to adhere to international law? Well, I think uh, that question to should go to Europe. Are they, are they willing to invest? Can they? But I also want to comment about uh, the finance and the money that comes to, uh, to Global South countries. So what really bothers me when we are talking about this money is the loan, the loan issue, you know? Because what, if I am to think, if I'm thinking correctly, you know, these countries, they bear the brunt of the climate crisis, and yet they contribute very little. Africa, as a continent, emits less than 4%, but it bears the brunt. And countries that do pollute are enjoying the benefits of this pollution, and they are giving money to continents like Africa that are suffering the brunt, and they expect them to pay back honey. If you are destroying my community without my say, and you want to give me money to restore a forest that you cut down that can't be replanted, Tim, why should I pay you? Am I paying you for the damage that you have caused? Is that grateful? No, what happens is, so I'm really hurt because my community is bearing the brunt. And where I come from, we are farmers and we depend on this for survival. But what happens is investors from Global North come to my community and they tell us, you know, we want this land, we want to uh, uh, plant, you know, uh, we want to plant, uh, for example, strawberries, uh, something that we didn't even have, we don't even need, we have so many fruits. They take your land, they don't compensate you, so that is what is happening on ground. They don't compensate you. And then they tell you, you shouldn't use your land for this and this time. You, ha you don't have where to grow food because this is where you stay. You have lost your property. You have lost your land. You can't even feed yourself. And then you have to look for somewhere else to go to plant that you don't even know. We have to buy land. They didn't compensate you. You don't have the money. And now you end up on the streets. And what happens, people just end up looking for shelter anywhere else. This is increasing uh, uh, the migration the, mm -hmm. the migration in and out. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is happening now at the global scale is people are trying to migrate to find other places to stay. And countries that led the pollution are saying, no, you can't come. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the doors are closed, so where should they go? Yeah. If you're devastating their communities, their land, then where do you expect them to go? I think this money should go to these communities because they are bearing the brunt. This money can't restore the forests. This money can't bring back the lives that uh, of the people they lost. Uh, sorry, this this money can't bring back lives of um, the lives that were lost. This money can't. I don't know how to explain it, but it's the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. It's the bare minimum for polluting countries to pay for the damage they have caused. Yeah, I totally agree and I felt like <laughs> the people as well. <laughs> you wanna react to that? Okay. Thank you. We're gonna take another question from the public. Ah. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, you said that there is, when you're dealing with the West compared to, this, to, the, to the global South, uh, there is a paradigm imbalance. Kenneth Kaunda said, entering in partner partnership with the West is like sharing a three-legged two seat with somebody with a very big bum. <laughs> they will outseat you and you have no chance of entering into that partnership. If that's true, how do we create proper partnership? Corollary to that is what 
uh, our greatest musician from Jamaica said that we've got to liberate ourselves from mental slavery. Hmm? Do you remember that, that song? Mm -hmm. From Bob Marley? Yes. Africa has to liberate itself from colonial mentality because what they are doing is what the colonizers did. This is in terms of our rulers. Zimbabwe was the food basket of, of all our Africa. It became a basket case because the ruler thought Zimbabwe belonged to him. Africa has rulers who think that their country belongs to them. So they milk it like nobody's business and then they blame it on the colonizers who've been gone a long, long time ago, emulating what they did. How do we stop this? How do we stop the madness of Bonasaro, who actually did to the Amazon rainforest? Cutting down trees in order to build houses, homes, farms. And I'm sorry, I come from Uganda. My name is Sentamu. We used to have between Kampala and Jinja, a fantastic forest. This was not cut down by the West. My dad had a huge land and planted trees in 30 acres. He died, I wasn't there. Who cut down the trees? People wanting to create charcoal and farm. Did the government do anything about it? We went to the courts? No. So when we look to the West, just be careful. We're not replicating what the colonizers did. Claire, thank you. I think this is a question for you, uh, Mohammed. <laughs> I'd like to differ. <laughs> I mean, it's a very complicated question. I mean, this is, this is, this is, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, it's very difficult, I think, if the West starts in, uh, get in, gets involved with, let's say, who governs a country. I mean, we've tried that in the past, and I don't think that went uh, really great. There are many examples where it went really wrong. Um, uh, what, I, what I can say is that when we are looking at these, in, in Europe we have develop, developing these GTPs, eh, Just Energy Transition Plans. We have one now with Senegal. They are on an individual basis. It's not like the Africa strategy because every country has a different approach. For example, with South Africa, a couple of years ago, we started trying to change their energy mix from way less coal-fueled electricity to sustainable electricity because at the end of the day, uh, to also go to the previous uh, question, it's not about the right to pollute. doesn't mean really to, to pollute. I really believe they mean that they should have the right to have economic development. With the current capital goods, it's usually pollution. If you would change them into sustainable capital goods, it means to some extent at least green growth. I think it is possible, but not on the long run. Uh, at some point, there's a limit to our planetary uh, capacity. But I, I, th I feel it's very difficult for me to... We have to have conditions on human rights. I mean, there are, there are some elements I think we should not accept. The way, let's say, women are uh, 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 tr uh, tr um, uh, treated, the LGBTQI community. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there are some bare minimums when it comes to what we think should be um, acceptable uh, when it comes to having a partnership with a country. Um, and then there's always this dilemma. Does economic development bring improved democracy, or do you need democracy first to have economic development? Also, that I think it's a case by case uh, approach. Um, uh, but for me, as a European in Europe, although I was born in Africa, so I'm African European, I, I'm very proud to be uh, uh, to have been born in Africa. But for me, it's very difficult to us tell other countries this is a pr exactly what you should do and this is who you should vote for. The consequence also means that if it's radical or, or if it's an autocracy that really discriminates minorities, women, LGBTQ, then at some point, of course, we have to, we cannot enable this. We have to say we, we stop our, our partnership. But this is a case-by-case -case, uh, approach, and uh, I really see a lot of, let's say, win-win situations with individual African countries, 
And again, only and only if the local community, the community benefits directly from these investments. And then again, I really believe that when it comes to finance for these type of mitigation projects, I think a loan is acceptable because there's a return on investment. When it comes to adaptation, we, this cannot be acceptable because adaptation means adapting to a current situation to a situation caused by the West. So we should at least help solve that part of the of the problem. It's not the full problem, but at least uh, that also gives trust, I think, for many communities to again undertake these type of partnerships. But that's a condition, I, I really believe. Thank you so much. We are actually at the end of this session. Um, are there any concluding remarks each one of you want to make in one sentence? Let's start with you, Ruth. Great, so I think I'll try to respond actually to the last uh, commenter from, from Uganda, and thank you for that. And, and uh, just underline a, a point that I already made, which I think is part of the Africa Youth Strategy already, to when it comes to consulting with African communities and, and giving people a seat at the table, they're not just the elites and, and really trying to amplify the voices of, of the people in these countries. Thank you. Hilda? Um, Take your time. Well, I would say if we want to combat the climate crisis, we should address the challenge from the roots and not the stem or the leaves. We should look at what caused the climate crisis and start to address the challenge from the roots and that is what will create a difference. Thank you. Mohammed? Uh, uh, the only thing for me is, you know, we need to stop talking about international climate finance. The a pledge of 100 billion should be finalized and should be made accessible. I think that's also a trust issue. When it comes to a framework for loss and damage, I really hope that we can finalize it. We can have discussions of how much is needed, like looking historically, but at least have an agreement if there's a crisis, if there's extreme weather events, we should directly help countries. There should be like a global shield. And third one, you know, let's show more ambition. Half of, there's a big, gap between what's needed for Paris and what has been pledged by uh, in t uh, by, by national countries uh, and, and especially looking at the global uh, north that uh, hopefully in December we can close this gap because also that creates trust to the global south that we take our responsibility and we are willing to try to solve this climate, uh, uh, climate uh, problem. That would be my uh, message. Thank you so much. The climate justice, the, the fight for climate change, or against climate change, is one that uh, involves, us all, involves us all. There is a lot to be done. Please always stay in conversation with one another and try to remember that this is something that we all share the responsibility for. Uh, and I hope you learned something from them. I definitely did, so thank you so much for your insights. I would now like to invite to the podium Jao, who will say some closing statements. You can stay seated. Thank you, thank you. Like Julia, I'm, uh, well, my name is Jean. Like Julia, I'm part of the FMS think tank. And uh, well, I would like to take this opportunity to first of all, thank our moderator and our brilliant uh, panelists. Thank you for sharing your expertise. It sure led to a, uh, an insightful discussion. So thank you, thank you. Yeah. But um, I also want to say something about the public because where does this leave you as an individual, right? We talked about so many stakeholders. We even mentioned the role of education, some politicians, NGOs. Um, but your role does matter. And your mere presence, your contributions here are really significant to at least uh, our revision of the Africa strategy. At the end of the day, we're uh, taking responsibility. And uh, with Arnold Tucker, uh, professor and friend we both share, um, I'll quote him in saying that all stakeholders matter. And so does the individual, so do you guys. And your questions, your contributions, of course, please make use of the suggestion box. Everything matters. And so I really want to hear a loud applause for you guys as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> really, we appreciate it. We appreciate it a lot. And uh, last but not least, I mean, like we said, Eves could not be here today, our good friend Eves. Um, Although his art is here, Mohammed also showed interest in one of the pieces. Uh, they are for sale if you want to know more information. We have a representative of Justice and Peace, Kirsten. Uh, she's also in the think tank, so you can ask her questions. 
Um, if you're interested, we can go back to the slide with the QR code. But yeah, I mean, we I really want to thank Eves as well, even though he's not here. I'm sure he'll see the video. So, Eves. and uh, <laughs> and FMS, thank you FMS, yeah. and thank you, thank you FMS Foundation uh, Max van der Stoel for making this happen and giving us the youth a stage to to talk, take responsibility. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, guys. Thank you. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Stay connected, talk, and as he said, we all have a responsibility and everyone, every voice matters. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. This is brilliant. Of course, brilliant thank you.